What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. You are driven. You have all the drive you need within you, but is it in alignment with your true values and core desires? We're on a journey together to unearth what really drives you, what matters most, so you can drive further, faster, and enjoy the ride. When you know what drives you, what you want becomes inevitable. This is What Drives You. I'm Kevin Miller. This episode is part three in my series on inner mastery. I mean, we think what drives us is the desire for something out there, right? It's having a goal and wanting the goal so much that we're motivated enough to do what it takes to achieve it. This is how I tend to parent, at least I have in the past. Uh, you know, you provide an incentive. Here's what you'll get if you do X, Y, Z and get up and do the work. Uh, it can work sometimes, but I realize it's it's kind of short term. It's a short term solution because once that prize is achieved, you're just going to go back to square one, kind of go back to your default. What we want is for us and for others to be always motivated towards positive results. Again, you are always have drive, but your drive is fueled by fear or desire. You can be driving backwards. You can be driving off on you know a detour somewhere, wasting time. You can be driving into a massive wreck. We all want to be driven to wake up daily and make positive progress toward these fulfilling destinations. And regardless of the destination, be enjoying the ride. This comes from the topic here at hand, inner mastery. And no, you don't hear mastery as a noun, like some destination, like we're going to finally achieve it and be done. This is a verb. Think of it more like I was thinking inner mastering. It's continually growing. So my expert for this series has been Hitendra Wadwa. He is a professor at Columbia Business School, where his class on personal leadership and success is one of the most popular classes there. Hitendra's new book is titled Inner Mastery, Outer Impact, How Your Five Core Energies Hold the Key to Success. So here today, I've got my brother and frequent co-host Jared Angaza on to discuss these five keys, kind of talk through them. Because Honestly, in my first talk, my long talk with Etendra, we never really got past the first key, which was purpose. Next, after that, are wisdom, growth, love, and self-realization. So my interest here is digging into how we have, I think, cultural meanings that are programmed into us, and we tend to misperceive all five of these core energies, and we want to get them flowing to better inform and direct our drive. Hey friends, I have historically had sponsors at the beginning of the show, and I'm going to take a break from this for a little while. Sponsors are who fund this show, and we have some great ones. I'll let you know about them later on in this episode. I hope you'll check them out. They've benefited me, and I think you'll find great value from them as well. Uh, But instead today, I want to ask you for a couple things. One, if you listen to Apple Podcasts, please subscribe to the show. Subscribe again. They made a big change in how they treat automatic downloads. And if you haven't listened to a few shows, you may not be subscribed anymore. And then two, I started an online community with my dad, Dan Miller, 17 years ago. We are now opening what is actually the fourth generation of that community. It's called the Drive Tribe. It's a paid online community where we're coming together with people like you and me who want to drive further, faster, and enjoy the ride every day. We give special attention to influencers and what drives you in your life and your desire to influence others and what drives people to you to be influenced. So go to kevinmiller.co. You can click on community that right there and find out more. Again, kevinmiller.co, click on community. Uh, and I want to welcome Wayne Herring and Caleb Becker. They just joined as well. So I'd love to talk with you guys in there. All right, let's talk now about inner mastery and how it affects our drive. All right, brother. Well, I know you listen to the show. You listen to Hitendra. And man, I just, yeah, I was out of my walk today and in the snow thinking about this inner mastery and how it is this this inner game. Uh, and, and I don't, a game sounds kind of bad, but we know that I'm looking at all these external things that I do that I appreciate and enjoy, but ultimately they're to help give me, you know, what Victor Frankel figured out how to have in a concentration camp with nothing, zero. He mastered the inner part of him and was able to have a lot of these things. Now, granted, he was really happy to get out and, you know, have food and shelter and whatever, 
but he had mastered it in her inner, which is why his book, Man's Search for Meaning, is I think an all time best selling book ever. But man, that's just daunting when we look at that and realize, uh, to me, it is about this is inner. We are just trying to shift the gears, you know, inside of us by doing all this stuff. And I can almost go down the rabbit hole and feel like, oh my gosh, everything's, it's all vanity. Solomon said that, right? So give me, give me your thoughts, man. Uh, that, I was just thinking about Frankel there too, that in, and recognizing all the inner mastery that he worked on, you know, in that concentration camp and then how much greater his capacity for joy most likely is because of that, yeah. because of his depth of pain. I, I, I was, I, I don't, it was not me that said this, but someone else did, and I use it all the time, uh, about our capacity for joy often being equal to our capacity for pain. Um, anyway, I just, I, I appreciate that. And, and the idea, you know, obviously, Frankel's been a big discussion in our family, you know, all of us. It was a favorite of dad's as well. And uh, that is a condition, an environment, you know, that he was in <laughs> that, uh, it was either, you know, I think at some point he, and he talks about this, you know, he either had a, he had a choice to either go this way or that way, you know, either he's crushed by the weight or he's not. Mm-hmm. And he had a, then a journey of inner mastery to go on in a not opportune environment. Let's just say, yeah, the rest of us comparatively <laughs> have a much easier environment in which it's almost a privilege to be able to work on so that self mastery. Uh, this is a, a discussion that, I mean, you know, my life and I've spent most of my life in that arena on my, all of us have in our family. I know that uh, we have our own unique paths in that we've all been interested in a deeper experience of life and a more intentional way of showing up, which is what we call mastery. I think <laughs> you know, there's lots of layers in there, but, um, I recognized right off the bat, uh, with Hitendra in that his conversation is very much kind of a, a carpe diem discussion. It's a seize the day kind of like, what are you going to get out of this moment? Like, can you be aware enough and tuned in enough, disciplined enough, um, in your own self mastery to, to be fully in this moment, to, to suck the marrow out of life, as I think it was Yates would say, um, or maybe that was Thoreau. Anyway, like I, I want to live that way. And, and Thoreau talked a lot about that again, references back to dad. He, that was one of his favorites, uh, muses and authors. I very much believe that our self mastery path and, you know, has everything to do with how we show up in the world and how we feel about it. So something I've been very interested in as an individual and certainly more even as a parent, recognizing that there are little humans that are likely to emulate the paths I take and the ways I show up in the world. Uh, Hitendra's discussion on um, mastery and and, and what feels like intentionality. You talked about like he about playing the game and it feels weird to call it a game. I feel the same way. It feels weird to call it a game, the game of life or whatever. I still have nothing better <laughs> to refer to than that. Uh, it, it's like there's a way to play this thing, and we are attracted to folks that we see playing it, the game, well. And then we're looking at, you know, you're unpacking what is it that helps them enjoy that game and play it well to drive further and enjoy the ride, if you will. Um, and that's what we've been unpacking. I just, I, I, it, I was. I was excited to to listen to Hitendra's uh, thoughts on this and thinking how congruent it is with our discussion around what drives you and so on. Anyway, yeah, it, it it's interesting. Well, it's interesting talking with you about it because you are a. I, I mean, to you know, hit hit one aspect of you, but you excel in branding. Okay, so we all have businesses. I mean, this is part of our new community, the Drive Tribe. It's about you know how us being driven. And then in our work, especially or in life in general, how are we, you know, attracting people and not a marketing aspect, but, you know, once they come to us, if somebody sees us, are they attracted to us? And there are things that we do. So here we are. It feels like a, like two separate games going on. You know, one, I have the game that I'm playing in myself to be driven, just me 
Kevin, looking in the mirror, nothing else. I'm stranded on desert island. Am I good? You know, am I good? And that's what, you know, he tender is talking about. It's Victor Frankel saying with nothing else, nothing, just me, myself, and I, I want to be well. I want to have myself known and mastered, you know, continually mastering that kind of like the, who is the, I don't know if it's the Buddha. Well, I, don't, I don't think it was, but somebody, you know, he said, you want to be happy? Well, then just be happy. Wouldn't that be great? Cause we go, you want to be happy? Okay. Let me get my favorite coffee, my favorite show. Let me, you know, kiss somebody. Let me do what are all these things so that I can be happy. I said, well, just be happy. Well, well, be great to, to, to be there at some point. Yeah. You even find that person and, uh, you know, my gosh, we've had, you know, we've had, uh, it was fun having, uh, Dadapani on the show you know, used to be a month and he's very quick to say, dude, I love my coffee. You know, I love myself, but I'm okay without it. That's right. the glory. It's, it, it's kind of, we're kind of into the attachment, you know, thought of, I enjoy it, but I am not attached to it for my fulfillment. So we're talking about this. So here's the inner game. And yet we also, you said something a minute ago, made me think about something that I've always thought about back from man, uh, you know, studying the Bible and the, they asked Jesus something about the taxes, about paying taxes. Oh, are you going to pay taxes? They're trying to go. And he said, look, render unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? The money is from Caesar, this marketplace and capitalism in this place. This is Caesar. So if you're going to participate in that, yeah, pay your taxes. If you don't want to, then go live on an Island and eat berries or, or something like that. And so here I am to, to master myself. It doesn't mean that I then go outside with a sheet over me and don't have anything to do with the external. I don't show the external. I don't care about the external. I, you know, if I want to, if I want to go out there, there's a game out there too. People are going to judge what they see to some degree that matters. I remember when dad, I remember when you got tattoos and dad was like, okay, that's fine. Probably going to close some doors. You know, yeah. you mean that would now that was back in the day. Today, I don't know if it matters so much. It's a different world. It's, it's changed, but I mean, in back in the day, he had he had a more valid point. <laughs> yeah, back then, well, it was the same thing with me when I told him I'm not going to college. He said, "That's fine. There's some door. You're not going to be a doctor, or a lawyer. Yeah. All right. It probably back then you wouldn't be with a tattoo either. So we both just ruined ourselves for those professions. But uh, <laughs> back then, at least." Yeah. But, you know, to look at that, there is a game there. So it's, it's, it's not, we're not saying that you don't still pay attention and dress how you dress and do things. And, and there's things out there that you, that you want, If you want a certain car, knock yourself out. If you want whatever, but if you have to have those to be happy, that's outside of this internal mastery. And I like just having the cards on the table and saying, look, I can go after that thing. But if I am doing that, if I have to do that to feel this way, to feel okay, if I have to do that extra, if I have to achieve that, have that, own that, um, attract that, whatever. Uh, and yet if I'm out there in the marketplace, render under Caesar, what is Caesar's? And it feels like a couple, yeah, it's, it's a, I wish we'll come up with a better word. We're smart enough to, but right now it's a couple games Fair. I think that that's reasonable. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a, yeah, I still have nothing better than it's a game. Then we got to figure out, uh, you know, how we want to play it, and that has to do hopefully with what drives us and what's driving us to to have a, a more of a, a maybe a, a, a better opportunity to play it well. You know, we want to show up well. Um, we want a good experience. A lot of the stuff that you were talking about with the some of the there's reference certainly to some some buddhist thoughts in there and happiness is the way mm -hmm. um you know which is infuriating for a lot of people it's like great <laughs> so so i just have to be happy in my head and then att happiness things will come a a attracted to me um it's pretty much that 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 is what i believe actually is that happiness is the way it is the choice as we can see from somebody like victor frankel you know who who obviously had much dire, much more dire situation, you know, environment around him than what most people do and was still able to transcend that and say, no, if I'm going to have any sort of joy in this or a good experience of any kind, it's going to be determined in my mind, regardless to the circumstances around me. And there's a, I think it might, I think it was in the, in the discussion with Hitendra on, on episode one, um, talking about the, uh, resilience. And that's something I talk about a lot is that we want to, like, I want to be waking up in the day and say, okay, I'm going to choose to be happy today because happiness is the way I, I know this, <laughs> like as the mantra. So 
I'm going to choose that happiness today despite what might come at me. What I really want to cultivate every day is resilience in that happiness space that I'm creating in my mind and that choice of that perspective and saying, okay, can I, can I maintain that when, you know, I get a flat tire in the car or there's, you know, something happens like that or whatever, or when our father dies, like we've just been, been through, um, can we, well, speaking of our father, he'd say, carry your sunshine with you, carry your sunshine inside you. He said that all the time. I think it's another way of getting at happiness is the way, but we, if we recognize that is the thing, and then there's this life thing out there, it is kind of a easy reference to get back in and say, okay, this is a game then (laughs) how am I going to, I'm going to do that there. How am I going to be resilient in my choice to be happy in whatever environment that I'm in? That really feels to me like a uh, sort of foundational aspect of mastery, self-mastery, inner mastery. Yeah. How am I going to be resilient in the way I want to feel and show up in the world no matter what happens to me? That is a mastery kind of move. Yes. Okay. I want to I want to align that. Uh, so yes, and for people to hear that cuz I've heard, you know, I've heard some of this for years and yet it feels like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's the, you know, the monk on top of the mountain with his legs crossed that doesn't need anything but a clover leaf every day. And honestly, I look at that and go, it's great that he can be happy, but dude, that's just boring. Seriously. And, you know, it's we've an got- easier route. I mean, a monastic life without outside influence has got to be easier than when you're getting hit all day long with stuff, the stuff of life. No doubt. Which, to his credit, Don DePani talks about because he spent 10, 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, you know, so people say, well, yeah, it's fine to have, it's easy to have peace when you're in a monastery by yourself in Hawaii. He's like, Mm -hmm. fair enough. But then he took that stuff out and now he has a wife and a child and a home and whatever he says, but I was able to practice those things in in those now, but I wanted to say too. So even even there, though, you know, Don DePani didn't take that uh, learning and teaching and ability, that inner mastery, and then just set himself in the worst circumstances. He's like us, and he's going to try to put himself in a place where resilience is better. And where is he? He's in Costa Rica. Uh, what is it, Nasara? Nasara? Where is Nassara. it? Yeah. That. Yeah, what are the blue zones? He's there. He has his ashram. I saw a picture recently, and it was showing the property. And I mean, dude, not hard to be happy oh, there. Man, it's, I know right where he is because we lived right there in Nosara. I, I know where it is. Yeah. So, so to that, but again, to look at it and go, okay, we're going to do things to try to make it easier. We don't want to be dependent upon those. I love the bright blue sky uh, days. I do love gray snow clouds as well, but I'm not a fan of rain. I move somewhere where it rarely ever rains. It's just kind of, this is not my gig. I spent a lot of years having to train as a cyclist in the rain. Maybe that's what soured me. I don't know. So it's not my gig. I move somewhere. It does. It seldom rains. Uh, and to help me more easily, you know, have that inner mastery, whereas somebody else is going to be out here. I, well, actually I know a lot of people, well, you're one of them. You would not choose to live where I live. Not your favorite cup of tea. You have some appreciation for it, but it's cold and there's snow and you'd rather be sweating and it's humid and whatever. But we look at these things again, these things are benign. It's simply how we react to them. And I, even understanding that doesn't make me say, okay, now I don't need anything. Put me on a desert. I don't need anything. No, I, I still want a lot of stuff, but it's back to attachment. Do I have to have that on the bad day? Uh, you, you said something a minute ago and I literally just, I've, I haven't been to the post office in a year more. I have no need for the post office. Two times in the past week, I've gotten packages, one from our mom, uh, that they couldn't fit it in our little rural receptacle. And I had to go to the post office with my little slip of paper. I went the last time I went in, there was nobody there. I hit the dinger. The guy came out. I was out in like 30 seconds. This time I went in, somebody was getting passports. It was one of those exaggerated. It's why they make fun of the post office. There was one person there. She was incredibly unkind, not even just surly. She was... I, I was astounded and it was a great chance before coming here to do this show to go, Hmm, how's my inner mastery. Now I sat there. I didn't like it. I didn't pretend that it made me happy. I took some deep breaths and thought I can't, I can't control it. I have a decision. I can leave and come back at another time when somebody's not getting passports and there's only one person there and they don't care to, you know, employ other people. I can leave. I can do whatever. But if I'm going to choose to be here, take a deep breath. I'm not going to be unkind to her. She has nothing to do with it. And she's probably having a bad day and whatnot. And, you know, the 
there we go. It's part of inner mastery. And I'm not going to sit here. I'm not going to go home tonight and tell anybody about it. Oh my gosh. You can't believe what happened. I was at the post office yeah. and it, well, it's, it's going to help nobody's. It's not going to increase my family's drive at all. Yeah. It's they, they don't care. Uh, and if I can be, if I can let it not affect me, why do they need to? Now, if I can't, if I can't get over, it, I need to go there and go, guys, I'm struggling. I had a bad experience today. So I'm going to not infect you with my energy. Just I, I'll go to my room, you know, whatever. But, uh, I, there, there we are with inner mastery. How do we react? How do we respond to this outer world? And that's the point is having our inner world, what strengthened, uh, clear. Well, again, I think that's the, yeah, it's clear for sure. But that, that's where the, the, we then come into the discussion of resilience. Like I, I want to be that lighthouse that, you know, can withstand the waves uh, because they're going to come. And, you know, and, and this gets into the mastery, you know, sort of methodology and that I see everything is training. You know, everything is training. Every moment provides a training opportunity. And, you know, I have to be clear about what you're training for. And again, just to be clear and, and, and just to own my own stuff there, I, you, I think we've, we've talked about this before I said my, my personal vision statement or whatever is to let my light shine so bright. It liberates the light and others. And then with the, you know, probably the, 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 the area of life I care most about that with is my children. So I already have kind of a, a little box over here that I I'm real clear on. It's like, I want to show up that way. Yeah. And I'm most concerned about that with my children. That's kind of my life. That's kind of, that's the, the rudder on the ship, the, the guiding, the guidepost there. So yeah. in knowing that that is the goal and being clear about that, then I have to think about, okay, how do I set my life up? How do I train for that? So that, you know, when I'm going through something sticky, something difficult, challenging, that that's the way I naturally show up. I don't have to dig in my pockets for that. I don't have to look for that. I don't have to search for that. How can I show up that way? <clears throat> I, I've been training for it all the time. And you train for it in the little moments. I mean, I, you know, along with all my peace and enlightened stuff, I also did combat training <laughs> with SWAT team and, um, and soldiers in, in Africa. And in doing that, you know, you train in the small moments so that when the big moment comes, it's muscle reflex. It's just a, you're, you're, you're already there. Um, I think about that all the time. And I think about, you know, from an inner mastery standpoint, it's really just me saying I'm training to show up the way that I want to show up in the world and to feel the way that I want to feel in the world. Uh, I, I think people have sometimes, a, um, it feels sticky, you know, it feel, or it feels prickly to say, um, I, you know, I'm training, I'm training for this, or I'm training for that. Training sounds like, oh, I have to do this or whatever. And I, I think, man, training for me, it's, it's just, it's a gift, you know, to say, okay, I know that things are going to happen in my life. I can deal with them when they happen and I can react to them emotionally, or I can train for it now so that when they do happen, I can respond intentionally rather than reacting emotionally. I want to, I want to respond from my my training actually it just reminded me I, and and I'll, I'll turn this over in a second but just to to think about the there, there's this quote that i use constantly and and it's more than saying it I, I don't say it that often to other people it's just in my head constantly it's like a little mantra running in my head it was it's it's attributed to an unknown navy seal so that's the best i could find on the internet <laughs> um and i and i i got it from someone else in a book i don't remember the book but they also made the same attribution to a, a unknown marine so the 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 line is that in and i can't remember exactly the first part but something in, in great challenges in times of great challenge or whatever we don't rise to greatness we sink to our level of training yeah default yeah let that sink in oh man that's good uh i love that and i and i think oh that that's exactly and i've been you know my life i've been through enough I've been through some pretty wild circumstances um, from, you know, being in buildings with bombs and gunfire and all that kind of craziness to, you know, to all the other things and that you've, yeah, that, you know, um, 
I've had some instances to be really grateful for the training I did prior to that moment so that I could show up in an in you know insane chaotic you know bombs going off kind of moment and be dialed in tuned in clear on what I'm doing not fearful you know all the stuff to to be able to take care of people around me and myself and whatever or to the other instance of the other things that you and I just walked through together with dad passing away and being able to be and having trained my whole life so that in ways that I could be present with dad as his death doula, I had no idea I was training for that, but that training applies to so many different aspects of life. It's, it's like the, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, I'm training for all that core level stuff that then can apply to everything. And I feel like that's real self mastery. That's real resilience. Well, it's an acute example to use right now. And I am going to tread really softly and say in this folks. So as you hear me, I am, um, goodness, please have some grace. So our, you know, our dad, if you haven't heard the story from, we did, we did a few episodes on this and uh, our dad, Dan Miller of 48 days to the uh, work and life you love fame. Uh, Jared and I were with him in Vegas, December 1st or something like that. Or December 7th, he gets a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer and given six months to live. And in truth, six weeks later, he transitioned, passed away. And we were with him most, most of the time. Jared is with him all, all the time. Um, and he's gone. And here we are. I mean, what is it? Three weeks? two weeks, three weeks. And here we are talking. And I almost look at that and feel like, I said, that disrespectful? Should we be in mourning, you know, for longer one? And I know there's other people out here and that it's waylaid them to have a parent die for years or forever. And man, I don't want to minimize that at all because if there's different circumstances, different issues, whatever. I am excited though, because it goes to the training. I've been thinking about this for a long time. I've actually been thinking about it in regards, we've talked about it on the show, but to my kids, I do not want to experience one of my kids passing away. I just have so many, the odds are higher. And I think about it and I have other friends who have lost their children at three years old, at 17 years old. And one got hit by lightning about uh, five blocks from me right here. One of them, they lived here in town. They went to Thailand. She got a little girl, three years old, got sick and died. It was my little girl's best friend. And I've seen that and thought it's arrogant for me to think that can't happen. I need to be training now so that I'm there for my family. If that were to happen, that doesn't take me out, that it doesn't ruin our relationships, whatnot. So to that training, now again, I say that, and I don't want to minimize anybody's struggle and their grief and, and whatnot, but if it is handicapping you from being present for other people, there's something to look at. And we are, this is what, that, that's a hardcore statement of inner mastery. And what you said about, what was the line falling to your level of your training? Yeah, that was that quote that I, I thank God forever said that, but we don't, and you know, in, in, in challenging times, we don't rise to our, we don't rise to greatness. That's the assumptions. Like people, you train so that you can rise to greatness. And I think, well, I train because it, 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 as a, someone that studies behavior, you know, I, I recognize we actually don't necessarily, and, and maybe it's just a semantics thing at that point, because I think that when, when someone's in a challenging situation and they sink to their level of, of training and that training is greatness, then we really are rising to greatness. Well, I, got, I got an example. Oh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was setting this up. I got an example. So I yeah. need find this, the guy's name. I have used this example, I bet 10 times. It was shown to me at a men's gathering a lot of years ago, probably a decade ago. And it was this United States Olympic gymnast. And so he's over in wherever the Olympics were at that time. And he's one of the top guys. And he does one of the, like the high bars or something like that. And flip, flip, flip comes down and boom, just kill, just terrible. Totally wrecked it. Totally wrecked it. So, you know, he comes off. I mean, other people this happens to, but I mean, it's terrible. It's like the worst thing that you ever want to happen. Totally, totally bashed. So he comes off of it and if, but it's the, it's the event where they're doing multiple, you know, events as a team or whatever. And he's got to go on to the next thing. And he's telling his coach, he's like, how do I recover from that? I'm, I'm, to I'm out. So his coach happened to be his stepdad. And uh, there was a video that I've never been able to find and it was a stepdad and it should, and I got to see the video and it was off to the side 
And ultimately, and here's the punchline to what you said, uh, cause the guy's going, how do I, you know, how do I go after greatness? How do I go after greatness? Now, how do I get on the pummel bars or whatever's next to go after greatness? And his dad says, dude, at this point, you got to trust the training. Mm-hmm. Trust the training. You have done those moves 5 billion times. Yeah. Your head's messed up right now, but you have done it. Your body knows how to do it. Go on there. And the story is he went on there and I think he did really well. I, I could exaggerate it and say he won the gold medal. I actually don't remember, but he didn't die or, you know, he didn't really hurt himself or mess up. It was a good routine. He did it. He fell to that. So it's great that when you talk about that, that in our, in the worst times, are we going to be at our absolute best? Maybe not, but how is our worst? Not that bad back kind of back to resilience. Yeah. I, I think about that in times that, you know, in, in, in a story, you know, or a discussion like this, I, I'm going back to like really intense moments, you know, examples of, of, of stories and things. Um, I think that's when we're most tuned into it and it creates a memory, but I've had situations, whatever, we're not to get into all the details, but just to say chaotic, often life-threatening situations. Um, and then it happens, it pops off, it did all the things. And then it's like the day or two later and you're like, okay. And then I can reflect back and go, oh my God, I don't even remember thinking when I did that. It just happened. It, 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 I was trusting my training. It just flowed out of me because I trained so much for it. And I'm grateful for that. It should be subconscious, not even conscious at that point. Yeah. I, I'm kind of laughing because I don't remember where it was in the timeline. This is like three, four weeks ago. I don't know if it was before dad passed away or right after it, but you know, it had been an emotional time. Uh, and you and I went out to eat with mom. Mm-hmm. And you went out and you were on a hard phone call and you dropped your earbud in the oh, ocean. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just like one of those culminations of it wasn't that big a deal, but yeah. it, it, I mean, the emotions had been building, things were raw and you finally came up. I'd been trying to get you up just to order your food. And you just said, man, I just had a moment. I wanted to deck somebody or hit something. I was glad I was by myself. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You said, I'm glad I was by myself, you know? And so it, it was, and it wasn't some horrendous thing. That was the buildup of a lot of emotions. It was relevant. But it was real life and going, okay, but you didn't deck somebody. You did sit down. We had dinner. And And the training in many ways, I know, (laughs) intentional training on my part specifically was I've trained myself not to deck someone. (laughs) (laughs) That was not always the path I chose in the beginning. Um, But I, yeah, I'm grateful that in that moment I had my explosion. I was on the phone with my children's mother and (laughs) we... Uh, and she was very graceful with that and let me have my moment and we had a laugh about it later on. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I am grateful that that, that didn't come out, you know, that level of, ah, angst and whatever, which was not directed at my children's mother. By the way. It, was, it was towards the air at the time. I was just, ah, I was having it cause I was, I had been so tense with all the stuff with dad and I hadn't let it out and, you know, and it was right after by the way. Um, and I, yeah, so that, that's another instance again, where the training is important. Like I didn't want to take that out on anyone. Instead, I yelled at the air and. (laughs) Well, I I want to, I want to speak to you. You you brought the the term up training that didn't come from, uh, he tendered necessarily. I don't think, but if you go back to, again, his book called inner mastery, outer impact, how your five core energies hold the key to success. And I look at, I'm looking at him now and going, you're your five key training areas. So here they are purpose. Mm. Do you have a purpose? Like, do you have a purpose? You could put a whole, I'm going to play with it a little bit. Like you have a purpose not to deck somebody when you're pissed off. Fair. All right. So uh, that fit in there. So you've been training that, um, wisdom. Are we pursuing wisdom? That's training. Are we, I mean, by proxy of anyone listening right now, you're here pursuing wisdom that we're taking from Hitendra. Hopefully we're adding some to that and you're seeking wisdom as we are. Otherwise, you'd be listening to the latest crime drama on NPR. Growth is number three. Are you pursuing growth? Again, by proxy of us all being here, apparently we are pursuing you know, growth. Love, which to me comes back to purpose. Is that part of it? Are we pursuing love? How does that pan out? Would there have been any love if you had decked somebody? Would there have been any love if I had told the lady, you know what? This is why I don't come to the post office. This is a... Right. I should... Somebody who loves a post office is on the show. 
It was a bad experience. But you get the point. You stick with the analogy, not the, 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 the specific thing. And then the last one is self-realization. And there we are. That's what we're trying to come to. I mean, if you go into the you know, Eastern philosophies and, and enlightenment and, and whatnot, so much of it is just, can I just realize myself and look around at everything as a game that this is kind of going kind of the matrix. I, I do. I, the matrix, is one of my favorite movies. And to me, it's, it's real to some degree. I think it is the matrix. Everything out here is a construct that I have made that, that, that I have allowed that I have chosen, whatever it's a construct to just try to get me to realize myself and be aware of myself. So on uh, training there, I want to bring up something though, that didn't come up with Hitendra, but as you've been talking and a lot, especially about our reactions, you, you said, that's why I thought of it. You said the word reactions a lot. Like, how are we reacting to something out there? Yeah. That's old Ziegler stuff. We don't react. We pause and appropriately respond. Yeah. We can do that if we have been training for that yeah. yet. Here's you have what to I- be able to, you, you have to have trained enough to be able to create the pause mm-hmm. between the feeling and the reaction. Typically, when there is a reaction, there isn't a pause. <laughs> it's just- We, we need that, like a bat signal, like, <laughs> you know, and, and pause. It, it's funny, because I because you put that in the new intro that I just read at the top of the show. It was blah, 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 and then you wrote the word pause. Oh, so right. I, yeah. I read, I read, and then- Pause makes a difference. <laughs> pause makes a difference. That we need that that pause, yet we don't do that. Here's what hit me when you said that when you were talking about how we just you know naturally react, is that how much of our life do we react because in our mind it is justified and we have not trained against that justification. That's I mean, a we, great way to put that, man. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I'm thinking of it as you said that because I'm so aware of my own propensity to do that. Cause I felt this is such a terror. I'm so sorry. Such a stupid little thing, but as I'm sitting there feeling my time is wasted, this is the dumbest business model I have ever seen. And I'm really upset at this monopoly. All right. That wasn't really compassionate, but it's how I feel. Sorry. Um, and, and I'm sitting there and thinking this is, and, and she's being unkind to the lady in front of it. Which is a choice just as much as happiness. Yeah. There was another lady that actually asked a question and she was flat unkind. I helped two people in line. I helped them and they were able to leave because I answered their questions for them because this lady wouldn't. And I don't work at the post office. It was just a little, you know, just, and I feel justified. I feel justified to complain about it. I feel justified to have told her off. I feel justified to whatever. And we look at everything that happens, all these circumstantial things, and we feel justified. COVID happened and I lost my job. My dad died. Uh, somebody said this and, and it really had a bad impact on me. And sometimes we are victimized. That is a real thing. I mean, you have things that happen that you had no control. It wasn't fair. It wasn't just, and it happened. And we feel justified somehow in this aspect of inner master, we have to look at that and go, okay, maybe that negative response reaction would be justified, but what's the outcome going to be? It's not going to be purpose, wisdom, growth, love, and self-realization. It's not going to serve us. If you had decked somebody when you got pissed off, you might've ended up in jail. Your hand would have hurt. The guy might've been bigger than you and hit you. You know, who knows? There's nothing good that's going to come out of it. And you realize that. So even if it's justified, nothing good's going to come out of it. And we don't have I love what you're saying there with the justifi- justified thing, because I think that's very, very relevant in, in, in alive in most people's lives. It's like they're, they're coming to the moment, they're, they're reacting in a way, and then saying, and here's how that's justified, so I can feel okay about it. You know, I do it. I, yeah. I, I, we all do it. And, and, I, and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, okay, because I, I know that I have moments like that. Which also feels victimy to me, <laughs> but it, it, so, uh, I know, but it, it, it's there and we do it. I do it. I'll claim it. Um, I, I, I then, ima- but I find myself asking the question, what would feel better than justified than my behavior just being justified? Like it was okay. It was just, it, it, it made sense because it was, it, it, it was a, a reasonable response to the moment or whatever. Or, or all the things that led up to it. it's justified because of, you know, and it, you list those things out, right. like what would feel better than justified in, in my, again, just to own my own desire and, and perspective, um, you know, our family motto is just be love. There's a big banner in our house, just be love. Um, if that's 
with I shouldn't say it with that being you know a, a guiding uh, factor in my life, what might feel better in that moment is not just to be justified in my reaction, but to have a moment where I can recognize that I transcended. The Dude, I just wrote the word transcended. Get out from my get out of my head. I I because you asked what would be better. Be I know you said what would be better. I wrote it down. It's in my notes in front of me, and I wrote down I've transcended. Yeah. Well, and to transcend that moment to to in in my case with my goal to be to just be love. It's like what if I showed up in that moment to be love? And I, I mean, I hear stories about this in in our family from you, from Ashley, from mom, from dad, all these. Because we've all been in some sort of training to say, um, I want to show up in a certain way, especially when things are popping off or whatever. Yeah. And and I've had so many circumstances in my life where I've recognized, yeah, I've walked into a situation, somebody was heated and whatever. And a lot of times, you know, as a strategist and former, you know, combat life, <laughs> I look at the situation and be like, all right, this one's out of hand. <laughs> there's, there's no way I'm going to penetrate this. So I'm just going to roll with it and stay steady. There's other times that I'm like, it feels like there's a little wiggle room here. What if I made this person laugh? <laughs> yeah. You know, and that and then that becomes the goal. But ultimately, it changes the sort of certainly my perspective, but also even the like physiology, every everything about it. When I'm starting to reframe the situation and what might become possible in that moment, uh, that's you know, th- there's a there's an opportunity there for transcending rather than justifying. I hadn't thought about it that way and I will now. So thanks for putting that up. Well, you brought me to the whole justification thing and thinking about, yeah, how do I, how do I transcend that? And that doesn't mean that you don't do something because you're talking about that. Sometimes we're in somewhere and there's something unfair or unjust um, where you may need to, you know, go, go to boundaries or, or justice that may, may need to be done. You know, something may need to, to enact, but it's still outside. Uh, I want it to be outside of my spirit. I am choosing to respond. Hey, you know what? I've taken a pause. I've looked at that. It's not okay. We're going to do something about that. It doesn't mean you're just letting everything go and letting everything be and be trampled over and, and, and whatnot. There's a place for that. Yeah. But this is saying the justification to, um, you said something a minute ago, and there are times when I am in the moment. I'm frustrated. I just left, you know, and, and I'm, I'm feeling emotional. I left a relationship or, you know, an encounter or something like that. And I will journal about it, a handwritten journal, or even I've got a journal on my computer and I'll sit there and just let myself go, Ugh, that's unfair. That's unjust. I'll do that kind of thing. I'm not going to vent to somebody else. I personally don't believe it. I believe it's bad energy. That's going to hurt their energy. So I'm not going to, I don't choose to inflict that on somebody else. Sometimes I'll inflict it on paper. Uh, and, or a computer screen. I'll do that, write it down and kind of get it out and then work on transcending and let that sucker go. Now I have, I've still had to do the work to process it and to understand that, man, I, I do feel bad about that issue. What is it that's at the core of that? Why am I feeling threatened? That's my big, that's one of my main words. I feel like so much of our the, the crap that we justify at the core of it, we feel it's a word I use a lot. I don't know if Brene Brown uses it, but threatened. Something's threatening us. Why? Why am I letting that threaten me? What am I scared of? And when I ask that question, there's n- often not really anything at the end of the line. I, I don't know why. I haven't done, there's no reason to be. I'm, I'm going to be okay. So and so is not going to deck me. I'm not going to get fired. Work for myself. Thank goodness. Um, you know, uh, whatever, th- th- there's nothing there. Why am I? And there may be some work to do there if you can't get past that. But again, as opposed to just this justified reactionary stuff, which is, I got to say, I know I'm beating the drum that a, so many other people are beating. I feel we're inundated with it more than ever. If you type in CNN or Fox or well, what are the other ones? USA Today or Facebook or whatever, social media, you're going to hear a lot of reactionary justification, polarized crap. That's just what's out there because it sells. It's a business. There it is. Uh, so we're amongst that. Even that, I feel like we've got to guard against that. Well, which is why you and I aren't visiting those news stations these days uh, or the social media or, or whatever. That, But man, if you're there, you're inundating with you. You're making it a lot harder to be resilient. That's like anti-resilience medicine. 
Yeah, and you're right. And in 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 that regard too, that there is a discussion around environment, you know, and I don't mean like ecological, I mean like what's your influences around you that are environmentally influencing you, yeah. whether it be family, friends, you know, even down to things, you know, that are more outside like weather and and uh in in for instance in in my case in often living in conflict zones that was an environment of violence uh and i don't i'm not painting a that picture of africa that was not africa that was very specific places in rwanda congo and uganda and kenya um in very specific situations but i i did get to the point when we were in nairobi and i had just been through our i think third bombing <laughs> um and and all that where i said this is not an environment that is conducive for me being the human that I want to be. I was turning into an animal and I felt it. I did not. <clears throat> this is important. I think th- th- this was, I well, did well, not. Ha- uh, back to Frankel. He didn't, when he was released, he didn't say, no, I'll just stay here in the prison. I'm good. Right. No, he's yeah. happy to get out. It's time to get out. Well, <clears throat> and I realized that at the time, and I remember telling Ilya this, I said, you know, you can see me <laughs> turning into an animal. <laughs> All the violence that I'm constantly inundated with every day, it's all around me. And again, I'll spare the gruesome details, but it it was gruesome. And I I felt like I've trained all my life to be able to transcend this. But at the same time, I recognize that at this moment of, of me being so beaten down after a decade of that in Africa, and there was a decade prior to that before I went to Africa, of similar work, um... I did not have it within me to transcend that moment. I was just being eaten up by it. And I was cognizant enough to recognize that and to say, I need to get out of this environment so that I can train better, so that I can become more resilient. I can't do it here. I'm too beaten down and there's too much coming at me. It's not going to work. I got to get out. And again, Ilea just, she looked at me and said, yep, I can see that. Let's go. (laughs) And we left after 10 years in Africa, went to Costa Rica in the most pristine of environments and there was zero conflict <laughs> um and it was beautiful and wonderful and lots of meditation and yoga and running and transformed my life and in that environment i was able to do the training that has built the kind of resilience that would probably allow me to go back into a situation like that and shine mm-hmm. but well and, and, and there have been some instances of that actually since I wasn't in an environment that allowed me to train enough where I was at. I I needed to get out. And I think that's an important thing to remember for folks too, is to say like, sometimes there's an environmental situation around you of influence around you that, that makes it almost impossible. And again, like with, with Frankel, I would imagine, and I think there's some references to this actually in, in the book, but where he was able to touch, sort of get to a certain point of transcendence and and resilience in in the concentration camp. I expect that that got stronger after he left and stronger and stronger and stronger because he was in an environment where he wasn't constantly being beaten down all the time. Well, he didn't. And write I feel like all this. you got to know when to get out. Well, it took it took a while. We, yeah, to to your thing of circumstance, I appreciate that. I mean, my gosh, there's yeah, he was not at his best but he survived and a lot of people didn't. So he survived and then right. he was able to come out and take what he learned and benefit other people. And so we are trying to say uh, here, or, or he tenders messages, we want this inner mastery so that we are okay no matter what. Now he didn't say, so put yourself in the worst possible scenario so that no matter what's happening constantly. And so you were right. at, uh, real realizing that. I mean, my gosh, if I've got a thoroughbred horse, I'm not going to put it behind a plow. I'm going to take it to the best place in Lexington, Kentucky, you know, where they do this and help that horse be the absolute best so it can win the Kentucky Derby and whatnot. Well, I want to win the Kentucky Derby in my own life in different places. So I'm going to surround myself with the best that I can. I mean, that that's it. But does my happiness, does my inner mastery depend on it? I want to be able to train to where when this crap hits the fan, because it's going to for all of us, there's going to be a relational issue. There's going to be a child issue, a kid issue. You know, your, your kid, there's going to be a, somebody's going to pass away. There's going to be a financial issue that you cannot 
uh, my gosh, how many people with COVID, you know, we knew, I mean, I, my, especially in this personal development, people who did events, speakers, they went from killing it to nothing, absolute zero victims. Back to what you said, we do have times when we're victims. So they, I, I hope that they, some of them were training to withstand that and they pivoted. That was the big word and ended up making more money than they'd ever made. Some of them went bagel. <laughs> You know, and I don't want to, I'm not dissing anybody that did. There could be circumstances that were different. And so it's not fair to just compare those, but are we training to what you said, to the resilience for when things get bad? And for most of it, it us, it's daily stuff. It's the daily stuff of dropping your, you know, there's strife going on and you drop your $300 or $500 earbud in the ocean Uh, (laughs) or for me. And I'm just, you know, I didn't put a lot of margin in it and I wanted to get a box from the post office and I go in there and it's just a bad system and it blows 15, 20 minutes of my day. And yet how many times do we let those little seem really innocuous things destroy us? And we take that and we vent and we repeat it 20 times to 20 people and bring their level of energy down Nobody wants to hear it. And it just goes on and on and on. That is not inner mastery. Uh, I mean, most of the stuff is pretty small. It's a little day to day. It's kind of like Tom Ziegler talking about earthquakes, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes get all the publicity. But in a given year, termites do more damage to the world. Yeah. Yeah, no one's talking about little termites. They are. Same with us. It's the little termites of our day that bring us down and we feel justified to go, oh my gosh. This is a crappiest day. You can't believe what happened. This happened, this happened. And everybody you talk to is brought down to your EOR level uh, by this. I mean, that's the majority of what we're talking about. And then once in a while, the big thing does happen that, man, I'm, I, let's see, I'm going to be, again, try to be really cautious. Um, I'm going to be incredibly vague. There's somebody I know who lost uh, a close loved one and it, I don't know that they're going to recover. They were not training. I mean, bottom, it's just, you know, we could try to be compassionate and whatever. I can be compassionate, but I can also call a spade a spade. Dude was not training. Hasn't ever been. He's been untraining and now something happened and it may be the end of him. We were watching it unfold. It's terrible. I wish I could change it, but my gosh, I can't, I can't take somebody who's never trained and fix it in a moment. It is our job back to what you said to be training. And again, I want to repeat these things. This is out of Hitender's book, purpose, wisdom, growth, love, self-realization. Those are his five core training tools in essence. Again, you, you're the one that brought that up, but it's you know how your five core energies mm-hmm. hold the key to your success. That was it. What, yeah. that, that last last thing that, or, or, that I, it was kind of a note that I carried forward from the discussion with Hitendra. Um, you, or I guess he was talking about the story of Ashoka, Ashoka, the great, or, you know, like Alexander yeah. the great, yeah. um, which is a story I'm very familiar with. And, you know, he, he was this emperor and ultimately was a war machine. Let's say, you know, like, like, uh, Alexander the great. And, and while Alexander had some of these reflections later on, um, Ashoka was known for then shifting and become because he saw the suffering of the people yeah. that was, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, as a result of his conquering. And he was moved by it tremendously and then became this benevolent peacemaker as opposed to a war machine, just to simplify the story. And Hitendra pointed out that the the miracle there, the, the beauty of that story or whatever, wasn't necessarily that he just became this um, more benevolent kind human that's that's wonderful but it was really about his ability and willingness to um transcend where he went where it's, yeah and and you know i, I just remember it, 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 what he said exactly was his ability to navigate the transition from here to there from war machine to peace machine that's phenomenal. I mean, think about the things that he would have had to gone through with his soldiers, with his generals, with his pupils, with his staff, with all the people around him going, wait a minute, we're used to following this war machine and now you've completely shifted. Are you crazy? You know, are you losing your mind? Are you... All the things he would have had to have been resilient to in his training 
to continue to navigate that transition in his life with the kind of integrity he wanted to show up with. And I, I think about that all the time now, with, especially with us having just gone through this tremendous transition with our father and thinking, well, this is a kind of a changing of the guard. You know, there's, there's like, a, this is a big shift. This is a big transition. I also feel blessed and grateful that apparently our family's done quite a bit of training, not knowing that it was for this or that this would benefit from it. Um, and because of that, we've been able to navigate this transition fairly well, not to say that we aren't grieving. And I still have those mornings where I wake up and can not get myself out of sobbing enough to get into a meeting, um, because I miss my dad. But at the same time, I feel like the ability to walk him home in the way that we all did was because we've all been training in those little ways every day in the little moments so that we're ready in the big moments to be resilient in who we want to be. Uh, amen. And you know, you brought up Ashoka and I loved that story from Heath Ender that it's not that the guy went from warlord and now he tender and others revere him because he went to this peacemaker. That's cool. But he tender saying what blew me away is yeah, his ability to transform himself to transition. That's one of the things that I got out of one of Anthony DeMello's books. And he uses a story of, you know, the, the great uh, Sufi or whatever, you know, this guy, somebody shared something with him and he, and he, and he said at 60 years old or something, he's like, Oh my gosh, I've been totally wrong. And, yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, and he says we don't do that. And yeah. to think about that, to think about it, one of the things I thought about reading or talking with Hitendra and reading his book is: Do we really believe we can change? Do we really believe we can change our thoughts, our behavior, our beliefs, the results that we can get? Because to go back to Ashoka, there's two things that uh, stood out to me. One, he was probably the still. It, it, might have been very much a similar guy. If he was a, you know, a certain personality style, he probably still was. If he was a detailed guy in war, he was probably a detailed guy in peace. Right. If he was probably a spontaneous guy in war, he was a spontaneous. It wasn't in authentic in authenticity. I mean, he probably yeah. still was, but he had a different to our focus. He had a different drive. Instead of to war, he thought, I think I can serve people better with peace, and he proved that. And so for us, that, that's kind of a neat way to look at it. It doesn't mean that we become something completely different and and next week somebody doesn't, or next week or next year or whatever, how long it takes, doesn't recognize you at all. Um, you're still you, but you have a different drive. Now I say that, and we have seen some people, you probably have, Jared, I have, and, and we've seen depictions, or not depictions, but heard stories where somebody has changed themselves, have been, oh my gosh, what am I talking about? I was with the guy yesterday, all right? I'm not going to use his last name so nobody will know, but this dude was, his name was Jim, uh, and he was known in the business world as this hard charging, and as he said, uh, a donkey, a-hole. That's what he said. Yeah. Uh, to the point where one of our other friends was in a business deal, and one of the guys said, look, if Jim's a part of it, I'm out. So that's this guy's legacy, and his, finally his wife said the same thing, and said, I'm, I'm out. Um, and so, and then his business partner said the same thing. He transitioned. Now, I doubt that his, his demeanor's totally different. I, it, it may be, I'm sure it is. He laughs a lot now, but he consciously, in a sense, kind of quote, changed his name. He's now Jimmy. Mm. He's, I got, I had to be somebody different. I want I to appreciate be, that kind of identity shift. Even he literally, name change, yeah. literally did it. Yeah, literally did it. And so today we talked about it last night at the dinner table with, I was with us, uh, six, seven other guys. And he went through the story again. Somebody brought it up. And that was a transition. It took him a while. And so now he is Jimmy. If he sees somebody old, he had somebody later on in another business thing saying, I'm not going to be involved with the guy. And somebody else had to go to bat for him to say, okay, it's not Jim anymore. It's Jimmy. And That's he's great. I love yeah. it. And there you go. Now, again, I'm sure that he's still very much the same kind of person in, in some of his predispositions and whatever. Yeah. But he has a different drive, which actually may probably does make his personality different. So the guy that I know today, he's not a donkey. He's not a jerk. He's yeah. a great guy. And I sat next to him laughing yesterday. I mean, the thing, and what I want to think is that's the authentic him. He was not being authentic before. He was being wounded. He was being justified. And now he's gotten past that. He's transcended. 
So to look at that and go, oh my gosh, I want to be X, but is that, you know, am I being inauthentic? No, but you're probably being inauthentic now. That you, you, you said that the other day, I, I can't remember where that came from. It was in one of your podcast episodes. And I, and I thought, or maybe it was with Hitendra. Might have. Um, and you, you said, but most people just aren't being authentic now. And I thought, oh my God, that's a great way to frame that. It is. I think people are like, oh, I don't want to change and be this way because that's not me being authentic. And I think, well, what if you right now is more of like your drunk self <laughs> and, and that's what's showing up. And and if you were, if, if you did some of this work and contemplative work or whatever, perhaps you might come out the other side, finding the real authentic you that you've never attached to or connected with, connected with, I think it's a better way. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I'm realizing that more and more, but anyway, I just like the way that you frame that. <laughs> well, th- I thought about that because I, I struggle with, we know that authenticity is a big buzzword right now. I think- I mean, a lot of my clients are like, I want to be more authentic me. How do I create that identity and so on? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it feels like kind of the millennial cry. I just want you to be, you know, oh, yeah. authentic. And, and I've kind of thought, what does authentic, you know, mean? And and so, so when we talk about this, about changing, becoming- you know, something different. I, I've, it, it's bothered me that people might look at that and go, oh, and not be the authentic, you know, me, I'm never going to cha- me. I'm not going to change. I actually I had a, pa- oh my gosh, I had a pastor. Uh, oh my gosh, you know him. Um, not Dan Scott, uh, the young guy at Christ church that you were buddies with. Steve uh, Chirker? No, no. You're going to, you're going to remember it in a minute. No black hair, fit guy, workout dude. Uh, you're going to think about it. <clears throat> okay. Anyways, go <laughs> you know, all right. I'm at, I'm, I'm, I'm in Brentwood, Tennessee with the guy at breakfast is like some Stan, Stan Mitchell. Thanks. <laughs> Stan kidding. Mitchell. Yeah. He's still a pastor today. You can look him up. Stan Mitchell. There you go. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. And, and we're talking about some of this kind of stuff. And I think I'm talking about my, you know, I'm not the most emotional guy and whatever. And I want to be this, whatever. And he ultimately says, says, Kevin, I doubt you're ever going to be this blubbering guy. I don't think that that's you, but you could still grow. And now I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but you could still grow in compassion. You could still learn to shed a tear. You can do whatever, but you're probably not going to be, you know, you're, you're, you, you do have some certain propensities and personality styles and and whatever that serve you well, but you may want to change your drive and open up some other parts of you that are closed off. So I would say the inauthentic Kevin has been very emotionally constipated. How's that? Mm. As I am growing and becoming the more authentic me, man, I've got big feelings and I'm trying to learn how to deal with those. I'm probably not going to be a blubbering, you know, person. I don't want to say that negative. I, I some of my dearest friends like you can cry pretty easily. And I almost revere that it, I don't have those feels yet. Maybe I will, maybe I never will, man. I can feel it may not express itself the same right. way. But I can feel, and I'm so glad because there was a time when I, I really shut those feelings off. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps people with that grappling that I think can come with. I don't want it because I think you hear that. Oh, you can be somebody different. I don't, do we want to be somebody different? I, I may want to behave different. I want to may have more control. I really just want better results. You, you made me think of something a second ago when you were talking about authenticity. I think what people are really scared of in that moment of saying like, I don't want to I don't want to change in this way because that won't be my authentic self. I think it's more simple of just saying, I don't want to change this way because then it's not the same as me now. I don't think it's really your authentic self sometimes in that situation, like what you were pointing at. A lot of folks- Better the devil you know than the devil you don't, yeah. Right, yeah. And it's like, well, I don't, it's change at that point that that is really the fear. And and that, yeah, that kind of goes back in a lot of the other things that we've talked about. And as people are are more resistant to the change, than they are really about the idea of not being authentic, I think. That well, that's a great point. I mean, we can take, yeah, we can exaggerate that with the, you know, the abused woman who keeps going back to the abuser. I mean, we know that we tend to have these better the devil I know than the devil I don't. And the comfort and security or attachment or something we have even to it's familiarity at that point. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. Oh, and the kid who's, who's neglected and abused by his parent who still wants them and cries if they're taken away by the police finally. Or whatever. So it, it, that's a good way to look at it. Uh, thanks for bringing that out. Yeah, that as we look at ourselves, even the damage, the unhealthy, the toxic aspects of ourselves, or the things that just you know maybe they're not that acute, but they're not getting us the results that we want. They're not resonating with other people well, and we're not connecting with others that we want to change. 
and yet, yeah, we're, we're, we, we all want comfort and we are driven. Well, there's the book comfort crisis by the guy we haven't had on the show yet. Uh, I love that book. <laughs> yeah. We need to get him on the show. Let's get him on the show. Yeah. It was such a great discussion. More, it more really, later. <laughs> it really is. Well, Hey man, we, I, I this great aspects of this. I, I, I should tell he tender to check this episode. Out. I took notes while we were talking because of stuff I want to think about and, and extrapolate on later. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Me too. Me too, man. Why well, hey, brother? Thanks for, uh, for doing this. And yeah, it's, it's always, always such a gift. Thank you, brother. Okay. Well, again, our muse here for this series on inner mastery is Hitendra Wadwa. That's spelled H I T E N D R A. And then Wadwa W A D H W A. His new book that you can find anywhere you get books is inner mastery, outer impact, how your five core energies hold the key to success. Friends, thanks so much for joining us on this journey. Uh, I hope to meet you in the Drive Tribe community where we continue talking about these episodes, about these topics, and go further. You can find that at kevinmeller.co. Click the community button there. You can also connect with us on YouTube and social media. You can watch these shows, see the clips at kevinmeller.co as well. And if you want to learn how to master your own inner drive, Check out my book, What Drives You on Amazon. And until next time, man, I hope you got great value from this episode and it helps you drive further and enjoy the ride. Yeah.